This is a little thing I like to call Jams Dev Camp. Today at Jams Dev Camp, we are going to have a session about the origins, creation, uh, building, maintenance of a little Drupal project called GovCMS for the Australian government. I have with me today Adam Malone from Acquia, who's been involved with a lot of that project, and I'm really, really excited to see that session. A word about Jams Dev Camp. There are a lot of smart people in our community with a lot of great ideas, and we like to share those at Drupal camps, at Drupal cons, at other open source events. But a lot of them get lost, and I would like to try and capture a few of them and share them with you so that we have a canonical source for this information so that people can find it, come back to it. So this podcast recording is an introduction to a session, and it's all going to be published on acquia.com, and there'll be the podcast interview there, Adam's session description, a post that I'm going to write about it, uh, links and references, Adam's slides, and the entire session video will all be on acquia.com. You can find it at slash podcasts, and you can also find it at the Jams Dev Camp landing page. Yeah, yeah? right? Yes. Deal? Boing. <laughs> Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. Good evening, Adam, in Australia. Good Still morning from Germany. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. How are you? All right. Hey, thanks for coming on. We're going to be talking today. This is simultaneously the Acquia podcast and a little thing I like to call Jams Dev Camp. And Jams Dev Camp came about because I noticed that a lot of people in our software communities well, they have great ideas. They solve hard problems and then present sessions about them at um, events so, uh, probably most every weekend around the world. And the vast majority of those mm, just disappear again. Not everyone has the budget to record sessions, to, um, you know, not everybody is able to write extensive posts about that. And so, unfortunately, a lot of this smart stuff gets lost. And I'm trying to preserve some of that. If I hear about a good session, if I hear about a nice idea and I can track down the person who's responsible for it, then it's nice if I can get them on here to talk with me and then we release this as a podcast, um, get the session out there and, you know, hopefully spread the good word. So today on Jams Dev Camp, Adam Malone, a, a solutions architect based in Canberra, Australia. You work for Acquia, Adam. Um, tell us, uh, introduce yourself. Tell us something about you. Something about me. Um, there's, there's a few things about me, a few interesting things. One of them was um, I never studied anything computery. I never really thought I'd end up in technology, much like a lot of Aquians, actually. Um, so it's uh, it's been a bit of a bit of an interesting road to get here, but um, it's it's not been a bad one. It's not been a bad road. How did you discover Drupal? Do you have a first Drupal memory? I do have a first Drupal memory, actually. Um, it's it's not it's not the best one, um, but it's an interesting one nonetheless. And I'm sure it's one that a lot of other people have have sort of stumbled into themselves. So a friend of mine, um, in he, he actually lives in Canberra. Um, he was one of the people who sort of said, "Why are you trying to reinvent the wheel over there when you can just use this other thing over here? This this thing called Drupal." So I installed it on a little server, like an Amazon free tier kind of instance. Thought, oh, I'll evaluate this, see what it's like. And then I did the thing that I would you know, recommend people don't do. I did the whole top 50 Drupal modules, top 20 Drupal modules. And I took the first sort of five links, downloaded every single one of them. This is Drupal 6. Downloaded every single one of those, those sort of top uh, 50, top 20 modules. Put them all on the Drupal site. Enabled absolutely everything that I saw. Looked at the page, was like, oh, that's, <laughs> that's that's a lot of configuration options. I don't really know what I'm doing. I just wiped the site and started again. Started from pure core and um, 
and uh, and did it that way. It was it was not the best idea. I had no idea what I was doing, but I thought, yeah, these these modules, yeah, they're great. I'll enable them all. More is better, right? <laughs> of, of course, the the more code, the better. See, um, can you compare Drupal now on the cusp of Drupal eight being released to Drupal when you got started? Sure. So yeah, Drupal when I got started was was Drupal six on the on the cusp of Drupal seven. Drupal seven had just been released. So for me then it was it was a decision between um, you know do I choose this this mature platform in Drupal six or shall I go with this cutting edge bleeding edge Drupal seven that that was me back then um, back then Drupal seven very very immature not not very many modules not not sort of a lot of um, a lot of functionality in the same way that Drupal six was. Um, also, it was sort of you know you look at you look at the way things were done then. It seemed very specific. You know, there's a specific module for a specific task, rather than more generic functionality, more generic API type modules, which we see a lot of now. On the cusp of Drupal eight, Drupal seven is such a mature platform right now. Some of the things that I see people doing with Drupal seven, things like you know services, things like display suite, being able to completely manipulate and alter page layouts on on in in any kind of way and deliver them to any different device. And in the way Drupal 8 does it with you know site previews and quick content editing and things, it's it's just a complete turnaround. It's gone from being this this sort of content management system where you you know you can upload some content, you can write content, put some files on, to being this entire framework where you can essentially do do most most things um, should you should you want to. Yeah, I'm also fascinated by the fact that it really is an application framework, but with such a strong focus on the end user and on the user interface. Mm. Yeah, that's that's one thing which so I do, I do a lot of demos um, in in my role, and it's sort of you know let's demo Drupal, let's talk about Drupal, let's talk about your pain points with whatever system you're currently using, um, and more often than not. It's it's that user interface and the ease of administration, ease of, of configuring things in the UI, which really sways a lot of people, you know, especially non-technical people. Because we as technical people, we, we say, okay, well, here's a problem. Maybe I can fix this in code. Maybe I can click around the interface. Maybe I can go on to Google and things. But the less technical you are, the less time you have to actually click around the interface and, and the need to know these things, it become it becomes more stressful and, and more difficult to actually deal with a system that isn't helping you out. So having this nice, easy user interface, having this this ability to do you know most things from there, but not getting too technical on the interface, it's been a big help to um, to sort of site administrators, marketeers, and, um, and and pretty much people who are users of Drupal without being administrators or developers of Drupal. Thinking about your history as a accidental autodidact software developer. Do you think that could have happened uh, in a world without open source? Talk about, talk about what open source has done for you. Open source has given me the ability to learn without paying any money. It's given me the ability to completely switch where my career and where my life would have gone. I'd have never, you know, had this opportunity in Australia because all of my university was in England. So I'd have never had this opportunity over here um, if it weren't for open source. I'd have never joined Acquia if it weren't for open source. So it's it's given me this completely different life perspective and this completely different um, route that my life has taken um, just through by virtue of the fact that I didn't ever have to pay any money, which would have been a huge turnoff. Um, if I'm honest, I didn't have to pay any money to you know learn to ask questions of others and to to gain access to the entire code base and resources which were online and um, and sort of you know uh, available to me. So this sharing thing that we do that works for you. It works immensely, and this is this is why I love speaking at events, at conferences, and and, and this kind of thing as well because it's it's taking a little bit of time out of my out of my day and out of your day, but the benefits to the other people who are going to be watching this, it's going to be, you know, many fold. People are going to be able to be exposed to all of these new ideas um, without having to pay a cent. Yeah, I love the um, Drupal, the Drupal community, I love the Drupal community anyway, but I, I, I particularly love that it feels like a giant show and tell um, every, every time I run into people. And it's exactly why 
I want to do my very small part here in, in sharing this information. Uh, you've, someone has figured out a solution to a problem that was bugging them and it was bugging them enough that they, uh, they, need, they have a burning need to show everyone else so that nobody else has to deal with this problem anymore. And I, I just love that. Um, what are you most excited about in Drupal 8? Most excited about in Drupal 8? Um, the, content use, the, the, the content experience, the user experience for content offers. Um, so the, the editing, the easy editing of content. So things like the Spark initiative and quick edit. So you know the, the back end isn't necessarily something where you need to go to all the while. If you spot a spelling mistake or a typo or something on the front end, that's just a quick fix. And it's something that a few other platforms have that Drupal hasn't really had in core until Drupal 8. Fantastic user experience, I think. The other thing is site preview. Um, site preview for me in Drupal 7 has always, in, in Drupal 7 core has always been a little wonky. There's a couple of really cool modules that you can use. There's site preview system, there's um, CPS, which is content preview system, I think. It's, it's a pretty new one. Um, they, they do a great job, but to have that actually baked into core and to have you know, what you're actually expecting to see showed to you before you publish it to be a pretty good mirror um, is, is, I think, a really good, a really good win for, for content editors you know, when they're ready to publish their pages and, and ready to, um, to get that out online. In the user interface, I really enjoy that it feels just like using Drupal, but the best Drupal I've ever used, the, 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 the amount of time and thought that's gone into the user experience and the authoring experience really seems to have paid off to me. I think it's, it's, it's um, going to be a revelation for a lot of people. I'm very, very excited. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, with, with developers and with, with people who have started off in code, you know, you, you, you definitely look at the back end and you think, great, this is all object oriented now. Great. We're using things like Symfony components and, and we're, we're structuring our code in the right way. But then you, you sort of look at how other people, the actual users, and obviously the users of Drupal are going to vastly outrank the developers of Drupal because, you know, not only am I a developer, but I'm a user for, for Drupal of many other sites. But there are also other people who just do no development and they administer sites and they manage sites or they write content for sites. So for me, having that like absolute top develop, having that top um, you know, content experience, um, while having a great developer experience and, and we're building a, an amazing framework on which to you know, extend with modules, being able to make it a great experience for, for our content editors and marketeers and, and you know, just, just authors and users of sites is, um, is I think a really, a really good step forward to taking Drupal to the next level and, and, and making it sort of really, um, really attractive for, um, for everyone. Talk about what's been going on in Australia regarding Drupal. It's been an exciting couple of years. It has actually, yeah. So when I, when I joined Acquia about two and a half years ago, um, started off in Australia, and I think we were about seven people down here. Um, so quite a, quite a small, close-knit, friendly team with each other. Um, now, in the, in the time from then until now, I think we're around 30 to 40 people. And one of the key reasons for that, one of the key reasons for that growth is GovCMS. Um, it's the fact that the entire federal government of Australia has said, you know what, we want to revolutionize how we operate online. We want to take our digital strategy from being this pretty old, pretty tired beast of a thing into being something very modern, taking hints from you know, what the US government has done with the White House, what the UK government has done with gov.uk. We want to take those ideas and then we want to leapfrog them. We want to make this platform that's available for the entire government. We want to make it so if anyone wants to get online and they want to have best practices and they want to have modern code and they want to have security and, um, and, and really you know, a, a strong base to build on, then we'll make that available. And, and that's been something which has expanded Drupal immeasurably here. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's been exciting to sort of um, be a part of that, no doubt. So GovCMS is based on Drupal and a lot of infrastructure around running and supporting Drupal. It is, uh, it, so let's see, let's see if we can put together how they did this, all the components. So it is a Drupal distribution, so a uh, somewhat pre-configured version of Drupal that meets 
Australian government security and accessibility standards. They have some uh, support in place for government departments. And I thought it was really a very, very smart move. The Let's see. So the finance department employs the Australian government CTO. And, right. and they didn't turn around and say, okay, everybody now has to do their websites this way. They said, as you pointed out, if you want best practices and security and support, we have this offering that we are fully supporting and we'll give it to you at a very, very cost-effective price point. Um, you know, there are a lot of, you do it however you want, but we can guarantee you that you'll be compliant um, you know, and we'll help you anytime you need it doing this way. I like that uh, carrot approach rather than the stick approach. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, it's as you say, it's sort of, it's it's the Drupal distribution. It's the Gov CMS distribution. It's built on, you know, a very, a very secure, stable environment on the Acquia cloud, which is itself built on AWS, which is, you know, very secure, very, um, very sort of, um, heavily vetted by the Australian government already for existing projects. And it's also that governance around it. So it's, it's this ability to sort of say, well, yeah, I'd like a website and then be able to sort of onboard onto the cloud, onto the GovCMS platform without having to go through any kind of procurement, which is a very government, government uh, slash hard ed thing. You know, it's, it's going out to tender and, and finding out the best approach. You cut all of that out. That doesn't exist because finance has done it for you. So you hop onto the platform and as you say, it's, it's more cost effective, it's faster, to actually go from the idea, the the kind of you know concept of we need a new site, we need a we need a new build. How do we do this? To to going live, um, and just anecdotally, um, we've seen sites go from okay, let's start this project to going live in six weeks, which compared to a normal government process, where I think procurement alone has to has to last three months. It's just this it's just this huge shift in um, the, in in thinking about how we take a site and how we put it online, which has in turn shifted a lot of departments to sort of digital strategy and how they think about marketing themselves and, and uh, advertising themselves to the citizens and residents of the country. How long has GovCMS been running and um, how's, the, how's the uptake? So as you mentioned before, the, the CIO, um, of the Department of Finance, a guy called John Sheridan. Um, he has been sort of thinking about GovCMS and, and putting his plans in motion for the last couple of years. And, you know, there, there's obviously been a lot of sort of tests of different content management systems, different platforms, what would be the best fit for the government, for the, you know, the federal government, but also state and local governments as well. So internally within the Australian government, it's been a bit longer. It's been, you know, about two years or so since, since it was um, first thought up. Now, Acquia first got involved um, around a year ago, I'd say, uh, and that's when we did a lot of work workshops and whiteboarding with the government and, and you know, trying to say, okay, well, this is, this is how it would work with Drupal. This is how it would work on the platform. Um, this is how the, govern the governance of GovCMS would work. Um, this is, you know, our responsibility. This is your responsibility. These are, these are the places that we can work together to make it a successful platform. So our first site, went live, I think, about six months ago. Um, that would be uh, the beginning of 2015. Yeah, so that was, I think that was govcms.gov.au. And then shortly after that, um, communications.gov.au, a massive sort of department um, here in, in Canberra, um, you know, one of, one of, definitely one of the largest departments, the one responsible for internet, phones, television around the country. Um, that went live on, on GovCMS on the platform. Um, and we've got huge amounts more at various stages in the pipeline. So I think live right now, there's on the, on the GovCMS project page on drupal.org, we're listing all the sites which have gone live on the platform. But apart from the ones that have gone live, we've also got sites nearing the end of their development sprints. We've got sites in the middle of their development sprints, ones undergoing migration, ones undergoing planning. So there's this whole pipeline of sites which are just sort of feeding into, into the GovCMS machine. And, um, and we'll be going live in a, in a staggered approach in future. What's the user response? How are people in um, government, uh, what, are they happy about this? 
So for that question, we can probably split the answer into about three or four different categories. So one of them is going to be the developers. So internal developers in, in, um, in agencies themselves, people who perhaps have some Drupal experience, perhaps don't. They're just excited that the government is moving to Drupal because it means that their skills are more transferable. It means that they can go from department to department and still work on the same platform. They have all of this knowledge. And if they switch department, they're not going to have to reinvent the wheel inside their own minds. They're not going to have to learn this brand new technology all from scratch. So for them, they're happy and it's, it's, a, great, uh, it's a great thing for them to develop on something that they're familiar with and almost evangelical about. For the content authors and content editors, it harkens back to that, that whole idea about, about making a platform or making a site which is usable and, and friendly for content authors, people who don't need to know about the development stuff. They don't need to know, know, know about any of, sort of the code behind it. They just need to be able to put their articles online, publish them by the date they need to be published, and have the tools for publication and the tools for um, you know, content, content creation that they're used to for, from things like Word and, and, and offline, offline um, authoring packages. So they're, they're also very happy as well, seeing them go through training or, or training them myself and saying, okay, well, here's how you create a node. Here's how you create a bit of content. Here's how you upload a, uh, upload a photo. And seeing that sort, of switch, that sort of shift again from, oh, before we had to do it like this, this is a whole lot easier. That's really gratifying. And it's really sort of awesome to know that if they're experiencing this, it's probably the case that other people who are not, ex are not sort of seeing it firsthand are having those same experiences. And then the other, the other sort of um, reception, I guess, we'd, we'd, we'd also look at is from departmental owners. So people like, um, you know, associate directors and things of departments, being able to spin up sites quickly, being able to reduce any procurement time, and having a really simple entire platform as a service to them makes their lives a whole lot easier. They don't have to go out to tender for a website for their infrastructure, for development, for design. It's all this nice, neat package, which you know lowers their amount of stress and lowers the, the amount of sort of work it takes to go out and, um, and lengthening that, that procurement period. Um, I suppose the other one that, that I haven't mentioned is for people who are actually using the sites. Um, I think a lot of the people who are using the sites won't know it's on Drupal. They won't potentially know what Drupal is. Um, but if we can give them a good experience, if we can um, if we can sort of allow them to find out about policy, to read media releases, to have their say on select topics that the department wants to go out and, and engage with their user base about, and they can do that in a way that doesn't affect them, it doesn't cause them to tweet at the department and say, this website is unusable, I can't do this, um, then that's something which, which you know, we'd be happy about. I suppose it's, it's that whole thing of, you know, if, if there's no bad comments, we can assume it's good. Um, no news is good news. So if we if we don't hear any angry tweets, then we can probably assume that GovCMS is doing its work and that the people using the sites from all different all different facets are uh, are happy and content. Well, that sounds that sounds really really positive. Uh, a couple of last points, and um, before we move on to your session, there is an example that I can think of of a similar setup to the GovCMS Stanford University standardized on Drupal a few years ago. And alongside all of the benefits of um, re uh, eliminated or reduced procurement times, uh, cost efficiencies, and so on, they had a bunch of knock-on effects. So there's an internal to Stanford shop called Stanford Web Services, and they run um, an infrastructure that allows any person associated with Stanford to spin up a Drupal website within a few minutes. And mm. it comes with a standard theme, so it looks and feels like a Stanford site should feel like. And he, they made a bunch of decisions around this Stanford distribution so that they all came with a configuration package that had, uh, for example, the same t uh, text editor and entry uh, tools and workflows in place. And they discovered over time that this allowed them a bunch of knock-on benefits that they hadn't considered at the beginning. And one of them was, for example, well, if every backend in this distro looks and works the same, then we can offer staff and student training 
on our system and make it very precise and very targeted. And people can get, um, for example, uh, you know, further training and education credits by taking a Drupal course. And the the benefits for them have have grown and grown. It's been a huge success. It's it's a it's a great model, and it sounds like the Australian government is is moving towards something similar. Yeah, definitely. I mean, by by making the the repository by making the code freely available to everyone, putting it on GitHub, putting it on Drupal.org, and having some really comprehensive, you know, automatic build instructions for for people to follow. Um, what we're hoping that people do is not only departments, not only sort of developers and departments, but you know, anyone interested in Drupal or, or has heard of Gussiness, they can take it themselves. They can take it away, you know, hack on it, code against it, um, improve it and then feed those back into um, into into our development workflow. Um, obviously, we're taking requirements from different departments. You know, as as different departments come on board to GovCMS, and they maybe they have this burning burning need for a, a piece of functionality that would be great across the entire the entire sort of government. Um, while they're doing that, we're also taking sort of pull requests and things from individual people who are just putting ideas in to make the platform as a whole better. So again, by making this really, you know, defined platform, which has these configuration options in that's that's kind of fine tuned for government and that's been battle tested for government, um, we, we're hoping to make that an experience that that will be replicatable, if that's even a word, um, across the entire spectrum of um, of you know different departments, but also across the world. Should other people want to want to copy our idea, we think that's we think that would be great. Um, it's it's sort of the, the true idea of open source to open source our code, but also open source the idea, the governance, um, and everything that sort of goes goes together to make make our CMS um, and wherever else it goes, make that successful. With that, if we've wet your interest, Adam is now going to present a conference session about the origin and creation and now the running of GovCMS for the Australian government. The podcast is going to end in just a few moments. If you'd like to come over and see the session, come over to Jams Dev Camp on acquia.com. It Just Google for that, Jams Dev Camp. There'll be a page with this session. Uh, Adam's slides will be embedded there. There'll be a video of the full session. And Adam and I are available to take comments and questions in the comment stream there via Twitter and so forth um, in the future. Adam, what is your Twitter handle? My Twitter handle is Adam Malone. It's <laughs> very my first name and last name. Yeah, I was, I was happy to get that. Uh, mine is Horn Cologne which is uh, not so obvious, but it's my handle uh, pretty much on the entire internet. Okay, so podcast listeners, thank you very much for stopping by. Hey, Adam, thank you so much for taking the time to put this together for all of us. Let's, let's assume that everything is working just fine because the <laughs> technology never lets us down. No. <laughs> you should know that better than anyone, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>